Okay. So yes, David uh, did a degree in philosophy at Cambridge. Um, uh, he... and the funny... Oh, who's that talking? Okay, let me just run into the... Okay, anyway, uh, so he has a PhD uh, that was studying conceptual change and scientific rationality. He joined King's uh, in 1990, where he's the Professor of Philosophy of Science in the Philosophy Department. And since 2015, he teaches at the Graduate Center at City University of New York, where he gives courses on causation and uh, interventionism. Um, so I think that about covers everything. Um, I will, as I say, monitor the chat. Uh, please do remain muted. And uh, yes, David, the floor is yours if you want to take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, I'm going to do a PowerPoint. I'm aiming just to talk for 25 minutes or so, and then we can have a discussion. So let me bring up the PowerPoint. Shout out if it's not working. Uh, there's the first slide. I see, David, you're good to go. Okay, that's all working. That's fine. Let me see what I can do. I can see more people. That's good. Uh, so I'm going to... Ah, how do I move on in the slide? So I just click. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit just about the logic of randomized trials. I'll talk a little bit about the ethics issues involved none of that's supposed to be new or anything it's just to set the, set the scene and then I want to look at a particular study which seems to me to raise some some disturbing ethical issues and I'll talk about that a bit and then uh, we can have a general discussion so good so logic of randomized trials uh, Here's the setup with, with characteristically interested in whether some treatment is good. Is it efficacious? Does it cause some recovery? Does T cause recovery R? And you might wonder, well, if that's your question, why don't you just look at the historical record? Let's uh, look back at past cases and see if there's a significant correlation between T and R. I mean, do we get more recovery among the Ts, people with the treatment, than uh, without? But of course, there's a standard worry with such retrospective surveys. There may be some confounder C, some common cause of T and R, something bringing it about that the patients getting the treatment are more likely to get better anyway. So you know, the treatment's being given more often to rich people, to young people, and that's why we're getting a correlation between treatment and recovery. It's a spurious correlation, they're both results of the doctors assigning the treatment to people who are going to get better anyway. So to deal with that danger, the standard idea is you need to randomize. You need to get a hold of a, a sample of patients, divide them into two groups, spin a coin, uh, give the treatment to one half, uh, 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 give uh, no treatment or standard treatment or something to the other half, and see if there's still a significant correlation between T and R. And if there is, then that shows the thought is that the treatment really must be efficacious because it's been forcibly decorrelated from all the other causes of recovery. So that's the, the, the logic of, of RCTs. But one thing that I think it's worth stressing is that's not the only way of finding out if some treatment is efficacious or whether some some T, I'll be looking at cases that aren't just treatments, are in fact causes of some result in in reality. An alternative is to stick with retrospective surveys and include possible confounders in the survey. So you survey not just who was treated and who wasn't, but look at their ages, look at their their uh, level of income and see whether T remains correlated uh, with R, I've left out the R there in the PowerPoint, within the young people and the old people, and within the rich people and the poor people. 
And if you do that for all possible confounders and still see that within uh, those subgroups, or at least within some of them, there's a correlation with T and R, then that tells you that, that uh, again, T really is a cause of R. Now, that's hard work. You have to uh, survey a whole lot of things, all the possible confounders, check for all of them, and, and assure yourself that, that T remains efficacious within those subgroups. That's hard work, but it's not impossible. I mean, remember, that's how we found out that smoking causes cancer. It's exactly how we found out. There was an initial correlation. The cigarette company said, oh, well, that's just due to anxious people smoke more and get cancer, or, or poor people smoke more and get cancer. And the epidemiologists uh, looked at those categories separately and found out even within them, smoking was still correlated with cancer, ended up concluding they'd been through all the reasonably plausible confounders, checked them all, and uh, uh, the correlation remained. And in fact, if you're doing epidemiology, that's really the only option. You can't uh, get a sample, divide them, and force one group to smoke and the other one not. You can't, uh, if you're trying to figure out uh, what uh, results, what the causes of diseases are, you can't, you can't uh, infect some people with a certain germ and others not to see whether they get the disease. Uh, if you're doing epi epidemiology, you've got no option but to stick with surveys. Okay, so RCTs are more effective at dealing with confounders with than, 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 than surveys. Uh, you, you deal with all the possible confounders at one shot by randomizing, whereas with surveys you have to check through them all one by one. Uh, uh, so they're more effective, even though they aren't uh, always feasible. But note that even, even when, when uh, they are feasible, they have certain other disadvantages by comparison with surveys. Uh, Standardly, they have small samples, so low powers can make them miss real effects. And also there's an issue about lack of external validity. Uh, Standardly, the sample is drawn from a group that might not be representative of the wider population and efficacy within uh, that group mightn't be efficacy across the whole population. Okay, so RCTs have some pluses and some minuses. And then there are the ethical issues, and uh, that's what I'm going to be concerned with, with today. And these arise even in the non-epidemiological cases, uh, uh, which don't, I mean, in, in epidemiology, as I said, you really can't do RCTs uh, for obvious ethical reasons, but even when you, when you can, even when uh, it's not like giving people diseases or giving people, making people smoke, they're further ethical issues and they're basically to do with with informed informed consent you can only uh, put somebody into a trial if they understand that it's a trial that there's two arms are going to get uh, uh, different treatments on the two arms and uh, there's reason to suppose that in many cases the patients don't get properly informed there's a basic problem with RCTs is that there will often be some prior information in terms of retrospective uh, uh, surveys, initial pilot studies, and so on, suggesting that one arm of the trial is more likely to be beneficial than another. I mean, it's most obvious with placebo trials, but even without placebo trials, uh, there'll be two treatments and standard treatment, a new treatment, and there'll be some indication often that one's better than the, than the other. Uh, if patients were probably informed by, about that, then uh, they're unlikely to want to go into the trial. Uh, if if uh, the trial gives you a 50% chance, like, depending on how many arms, of getting the best treatment, uh, and a 50% chance of not getting the best treatment, you'd much rather be outside the trial and get the best treatment, uh, uh, whatever. So there's a worry that in cases like that, if patients are going into the trial, it's because they're not properly informed. Now, we're told often that that's not a real danger because the ethics of randomized trials require that doctors only conduct trials when they're fully equipoised. Uh, when they really aren't sure, don't know which of the different treatments is the best one. 
But the notion of equipoise really covers up the worry I'm raising here. If you read the guidelines for equipoise, when doctors are sufficiently equipoised to be able to say to the patients, we don't know which treatment is best and conduct a trial, the guidelines stand equivocate between two quite different things. One thing is where we really do think all the trial arms are equally good on the evidence. We really have no reason to choose between them. If it was our child with, with the illness, we'd be happy to spin a coin to see what treatment they've got. That's, 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 uh, that's real equipoise. And in that case, you can explain it to the patients and the patients will have absolutely no reason not to go into the trial. I mean, uh, all, all the different arms are equally, equally prescribable. But it's a quite different thing, which is standardly said to be sufficient for equipoise in the guidelines, is that we aren't yet certain about the efficacy of the treatment, about which one is best, and we'd like rather more evidence than we have so far. And when doctors say we don't know which is best, it's often that they mean the latter and not the former. But the latter is quite consistent with their having plenty of evidence that one, one treatment arm is better than another. And uh, in that case, if they explain that clearly to patients, they'd be short of patients for the trial. And I worry that because of the general conviction among doctors that RCTs are the only way to advance medical knowledge, they standardly fudge this difference. They induce patients into trials by saying, we don't know which treatment is best, uh, implying that they're all equally good, when in truth it's B, they might have quite a lot of evidence that one is better than another, uh, and uh, patients who aren't prepared to sacrifice their, their, their treatment in the greater good of advancing knowledge would not enter the trial. And I've often worried about this issue. I've been worrying about it for 30 years or so. Ian Kennedy, Professor Sir Ian Kennedy, gave a talk that I went to 35 years ago raising this issue. And uh, he said, as far as he could see, RCTs were scarcely ever, ever justified. Uh, and uh, patients were likely to be being induced into them uh, by this kind of equivocation. And uh, made a great impression on me about, about, I don't know, 20 years after that, I said to him, whatever happened to that work? Did you, didn't you develop it? And he said, couldn't get in with it. Nobody was interested. And that's the issue I want to raise now. So I want to talk about the specific study. And this is the seesaw study. Some of you might have come across it. It's a, it's a much better celebrated, very successful, very informative RCT conducted by the Oxford Orthopedics Department. And it's designed, it was designed to assess the efficacy of the standard decompression surgery for shoulder pain. Standard surgery for shoulder pain is you go into somebody's shoulder and you shave off a bit of bone spur and uh, it's, uh, it's supposed to alleviate their, their pain. But does it? I mean, the, 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 the doctors, the surgeons, uh, became curious, I mean, about whether this, this procedure really did any good. But they did a big surgical RCT. They got, they got 300 odd patients, 313 patients, and assigned them at random to three arms. So the one arm, 100 plus patients, got, got the standard surgery, the general anesthetic, uh, uh, shoulder, went into the shoulder with an arthroscope, uh, looked around, and then shaved off a bit of bone spur. Second arm was watchful waiting, nothing done. They, they, you know, they carried on seeing the doctor, um, advised about exercise, but, but no, no surgery. And the third arm was placebo surgery. Uh, it was exactly like the first arm, they had a general anesthetic, shoulder opened up, but then the shoulder was sewn up again, nothing was done. Full-on placebo surgery. And the results are very interesting. So uh, the normal surgery was a bit better than the watchful waiting, but it turned out no more so than see the placebo surgery. So if there was any benefit to surgery, it seemed to be just a placebo effect. 
So very, very interesting and successful trial. But an obvious question is, how did they get all those patients to go into the trial? How did they get 300 plus patients to accept a third chance of a bogus operation with a full on general anesthetic and an arthroscope being poked around inside your shoulder and then nothing done and your shoulders are up. Uh, you're waked up, you're sent home the next day after general anesthetic. And it, it, then I found out about this. We had the lead author of the, of the trial, the study, gave a seminar at King's to uh, our salary, uh, philosophy of medicine group, uh, some while, a year or two before the, the results were published, but he was describing the trial. And I said to him, wonderfully interesting trial, but how did you get anybody to, to sign up? And he said, well, some, some, he admitted, some sleight of hand might have been involved. And uh, I was always interested in this. And, and uh, later I managed to get hold of the patient information sheet. And I read around uh, there was various publications associated with the trial, including one in the Journal of Medical Ethics. Uh, and uh, the patient information sheet makes very interesting reading. So here's how it describes the two surgical operations, two surgical options. So it's got three, it's, uh, the third, the third uh, option was the watchful waiting, but here's the two surgical ones. One was shoulder arthroscopy, keel operation performed under general anesthetic. Inside of your shoulder is viewed using a special camera, shoulders assessed to see if there are any problems with your tendons or joints, your shoulder joint will also be washed out. And the other one was the arthroscopic subacromial decompression, also a keyhole operation, apart from the shaving away of a small amount of bone, this operation very similar to the shoulder arthroscopy above. That's all it says about the two surgical options. If you're wondering, it was the first of these that's a placebo and the second, as it says, has also the, the bone uh, being shaved away. But uh, if you read that, you might well form the impression that both of them had some active surgical element. Nothing in that suggests that the first one is just a placebo. And if you read through the whole patient information sheet, you won't get that uh, impression corrected. Uh, only in one passage does the information sheet go back to the three options. And all it says is any one of the three treatments that we're comparing would be a good option for you. And until we've completed the study, we can't be sure which one is best. Uh, the term placebo appears nowhere in the information sheet. Uh, you might form the impression that's not a placebo. You might think the washing out uh, might have some therapeutic effect, but uh, that's not what the uh, designers of the study had in mind. Uh, the Lancet report, which is aimed at medical professionals rather than uh, prospective patients, was quite explicit. Uh, the arthroscopy, arthroscopy only uh, option, the, the first option, was a placebo as the essential surgical element was omitted. So that's the patient information sheet. So as I said, the lead author of the study admitted when we pressed him at the, the King seminar that some slate of hand had been used. And later in the same seminar, he explained that, that the researchers saw this as a utilitarian matter. They thought that uh, you needed to induce patients into surgical uh, RCTs because if you didn't, we'd be left in the dark ages of, of, of ignorance. There was no way of figuring out uh, uh, whether the operation was efficacious with, with uh, a randomized trial. Now, we, we, we might discuss whether, whether that's true. I suggested earlier that retrospective data can give you good information about efficacy as well. Maybe you feel that in the case of surgical trials, I mean, surgical issues, it's not so, not so easy. But still, even if it were the only way to advance our knowledge, I can't see how the end justifies the means in this kind of case. Look, these are patients that come to 
uh, NHS patients, they come to the doctors, they're expecting the best treatment. You can't, you can't uh, use sleight of hand to deceive them into a trial in the interest of greater knowledge. I mean, I don't see the end justifies the means. I mean, that's, that's basically conducting medical experiments on non-compliant human subjects. Uh, not a good thing. So, there's a funny aspect to this, and that's what I want to raise with you. So last year, I wrote a piece on the, there's an Agora philosophy, public philosophy series on the New Statesman website, and I wrote about this, this particular study, explaining what I've just explained, that as far as I could see, uh, the patients had been, had been tricked into enrolling in the trial. The new statesmen were rather anxious about it. They didn't want to publish the, the, uh, the piece without offering the Oxford doctors a right of reply. So the, 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 the people behind the, the study then replied to my article. Uh, they're both there. You, you can go to the New Statesman website. Just, just Google me uh, and New Statesman or Seesaw. You'll get it and you'll get the, the Oxford team's response. And uh, I found their response very interesting too. I mean, they, they explained that they thought it would be unhelpful to use the term placebo. Uh, because the patients would, uh, it wasn't quite clear. I mean, they, uh, they, 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 they discussed it and they said it was better to avoid the term placebo, it, it would confuse the patients. And they appealed to the fact that they were equipoised, they, they uh, weren't certain which of the different treatments would be better, though of course one was a placebo and they could scarcely have thought that it was going to be better than the active surgery. And in fact, so, so the, you, you can go and read the, the, the two pieces on the New States and website. In fact, there was some exchange on social media afterwards, and, and I explained it. I, I didn't disagree with what they, what they said in their report. I didn't disagree with their description of what they'd done. I just disagreed with them uh, in that they seemed to think it was perfectly ethically acceptable to do what they'd done, and it seemed to me it just wasn't. But the funny thing was that nobody else seemed interested. I, th I thought that piece would make a big splash for exposing some very bad medical practice. And uh, when I actually pressed people, uh, I buttonholed them in the corridor and so on, I got various medical friends and said, what do they say? No, no, that's, 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 that's pushing it too far. One, one senior doctor of mine I know said, oh, that was, that's a very, very brave trial, meaning it was really pushing the envelope of what was ethically acceptable. But when it was published, apart from me, nobody seemed to think the seesaw study was particularly objectionable at all. Everybody seemed to think it was perfectly acceptable. So what I'd like to discuss with you now is whether you agree with that or not. Okay, so I'm coming back into real life here yeah. good okay so that's that's the end of my thank my you um, thank you david it was a very very good talk um so nobody has put anything in the chat but what we can do is um people can raise their hands uh virtually with the option on the uh, zoom or um we can just Okay, so somebody already has a question. So Mittal, do you want to unmute yourself, Mittal, and then you can ask? Yeah, so can you see me, David? I can. David, hello, thank you for your talk. Very, very uh, provoking, thought provoking as well. Um, you focused in your presentation mainly on uh, potential benefits of interventions. I'd, I'd like to ask you about the role of considering potential harms of interventions. I'm thinking, um, based on your presentation, you've got me thinking back to the Parkinson's disease fetal transplant tissue surgery, where all the animal data, um, including non-human primates, suggested that fetal um, dopaminergic stem cells or neurons transferred into the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease should be beneficial. Mm -hmm. And those studies included sham surgery as well. 
And what was interesting about those studies from memory, so I apologize if I get some details wrong, is that the, um, there was no, no benefit, clear benefit to the surgery, mm -hmm. even though all the data says it could be beneficial. In fact, those with sham surgery did better than those with the real surgery because the sham surgery patients had um, side effects, dyskinesias specifically, which was not predicted at all. And in the experiment was needed to demonstrate that the actual intervention was harmful. Um, even though the neurons took and they made sense scientifically, it ended up being harmful. So I'd just like to ask you but about it was, it was it was it was the active arm that got the harm. The active arm was harm yeah. was more harmful, yeah. And there are examples in vitamin supplements in cancer studies, the beta carotene story as well, where the active arm ends up being harmful. In fact, the beta carotene story is interesting because the epidemiology suggested it should be beneficial. And then a randomized trial was done and it actually turned out to be more harmful in um, smokers for lung cancer um, as well. So but my general question is really about. So, so it was as well as benefits. Yeah. Look, there's interesting issues about placebo. So I'm taking it from the example you're giving is that sure. the, the, the survey, the retrospective data, suggested that the surgical procedure was advantageous yeah and then the randomized trial brought out that the advantage was all placebo and in fact the the active surgery was worse than the placebo correct I yeah mean, it I, seems to be the case yes look you might be wondering with these cases why we're doing a placebo against the active surgery uh, I mean suppose that I mean this is a, away from the topic I'm talking about is that there's a rather funny bit of logic here S -s suppose that the surgery really is efficacious suppose it's suppose it's really quite strongly efficacious in both both your case and the case I'm talking about uh, enough to make it worth doing the surgery in order for the benefits right and suppose you discover that it's all a placebo effect. What are you going to do then? Are you going to keep it a secret as a placebo effect and carry on doing it? I've just said by hypothesis, it's a surgery worth doing. Ooh. So there's, there's a kind of issue here that uh, uh, we're better off not knowing that the placebo surgery is better than the active surgery. Well, I, I think mean, we... I, I mean, I, I would think it's unethical to proceed with the surgery because surgery comes with risks as well. Quite so, but, but uh, so given that, the, <clears throat> so you think that the risks of surgery are justified if you think you're doing the surgery with an active component, but wouldn't be justified if you knew that the, the great benefits coming from the surgery were all placebo. I mean, I can't see what's the logic of that. The only logic is that you can't really go on doing a placebo surgery. Well, it's, that's just the standard issue of placebos. You sure. You mention the sugar pill, are you allowed to deceive them into saying, well, it's- yeah, I think the deception is an interesting issue. And I think that's a, a separate issue, but I think we, I think my question is really about considering the harms as well as the benefits. Um, I don't, I, I don't see with respect to uh, patient information that, that that's a different question. Uh, I agree with you on the deception uh, issue. I, I would much prefer to do these studies without deception. And there are randomization methods that, that try to remove deception as well. Could I, uh, could, could I just bring Alexander in because he yeah. said he has a remark on this. Uh, Stuart, I'll welcome to you afterwards, but Alexander, do you want to... Um, Yes, it, it was just really to, um, you say a bit, bit more about uh, Mittal's question, because it seemed to me the logic of it was that uh, you, David, said that it was part of your case that this was unethical, that they couldn't have considered, it wouldn't have been reasonable for them to have thought that the, the placebo case would have been better. Right? You said that. No. 
Um, and what Mittal is saying is, well, actually, it's perfectly reasonable for them to have, they could well have wondered whether the placebo might have been better, because there are other cases where the placebo is better. So if there was a genuine question about whether the placebo might have been better because the active arm could have had harms, mm -hmm. then doesn't that undermine your case for this being unethical? Are you saying that, that it's possible that they really were completely equipoised between the three treatments? And uh, so in some cases, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 I'm not, I don't know enough about this study to, to think that that was case, true here, but as a Mittel's point is that, that there will be cases where that is, that is so. Um, I, mean, I mean, at least that's a corollary of his point. I'm not saying that. No, I, I, I did suggest in passing that, that, that I was assuming that wasn't the case.